ray is missing. Terrific. Um, thank you all for uh, for coming to uh, the what we are referring to as sort of the research hearings um, for the Commission to Reform New York City's property taxes. We are um, very fortunate today to have um, three people that we've called upon uh, to really help us with this uh, question about how property taxes affect both um, the values of homes, the values of rental buildings, and the rents within those buildings. So um, we have a great uh, group of experts to call from. Um, first, we have Andrew McLaughlin, who's the executive director of the New York City Rent Guidelines Board, who will uh, talk with us about the way in which property taxes affect the index that's used uh, as part of the process for setting rent increases for rent-regulated apartments. And then we ha uh, we're lucky to have uh, uh, Professor Bradley Borden, who's a professor at Brooklyn Law School and works on a wide variety of uh, tax issues, including um, uh, the ways in which property taxes and all taxes affect real estate uh, planning uh, and uh, transactions. And then we also are very fortunate to have uh, Professor David Merriman, who's the, um, am I pronouncing this correctly, the Stuckel? Stuckel. Stuckel, sorry. Stuckel Presidential Professor um, in the Department of Public Administration at the University of Illinois. And Professor Merriman has um, written extensively about property tax uh, issues. And so we very much appreciate your making uh, yourselves available for the commission and, um, and really look forward to talking with you. So we're going to start with um, Andrew McLaughlin, who's going to walk us through, oh yeah, we, I always forget the things, the important things. Um, so we're going to uh, uh, introduce the members of the, uh, the commission. Uh, I'm Vicki Bean, I'm one of the co-chairs um, of the commission, and I'll go to my co-chair. I'm Mark Shaw, co-chair. Alan Capelli, uh, city planning commissioner and uh, class one property owner. Ken Knuckles, uh, Vice Chair of City Planning Commission and a Class One property owner. Latanya McKinney, representing the City Council. Francesco Brindisi, representing the Office of Management and Budget. Yeah. Carol James Parrott, Director of Economic Development and Fiscal Policy and Center for New York City Affairs at the New School and a Class One property owner. Uh, Gary Rodney, Commission Member. Jacques Gia, New York City Finance Commissioner. Terrific. Uh, so, Andrew, we'd love to hear from you about um, the simple matter of how uh, property taxes figure into uh, rents and rent regulated, yeah. rent stabilized and rent controlled apartments. Sure, absolutely. It's a pleasure being here this morning. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I believe just reading my testimony, it's a complex topic, and reading the testimony will probably give um, the best way for me to present it make sure I don't leave anything out. Um, and I don't know how you want to work, but you can certainly interrupt me if you have questions as we go along. That, that's certainly fine. Okay. Thank you. Um, good morning, Chair Bean and Chair Shaw and members of the committee. I am Andrew McLaughlin, Executive Director of the New York City Rent Guidelines Board. Thank you for the invitation to appear before you today as you consider reforms to the current property tax system in New York City. I have been asked to appear before this committee to address how changes in the property tax system might impact both owners and tenants of multifamily buildings that contain rent-stabilized units. In particular, how these changes may impact our annual price index of operating costs, one of the tools that the board uses to promulgate renewal lease adjustments for nearly one million rent-stabilized apartments, lofts, and hotels in New York City. Generally speaking, multifamily buildings with six or more units built prior to 1974 are subject to rent stabilization. However, multifamily buildings built after 1974 can also contain stabilized units. Under Section 421A of the Real Property Tax Law, newly constructed dwellings in New York City could elect to receive real estate tax exemptions in exchange for placing units in rent stabilization for a specified period of time which is 10 to 25 years. 
According to the 2017 Housing and Vacancy Survey, there are over nine, 966,000 rent stabilized units in New York City, of which approximately 88,000 units were built after 1974. Rent stabilized units represent about 44% of the city's entire rental stock and about 30% of all housing units, that's renter and owner. So each year, the Rent Guidelines Board is required by law to investigate in conditions within the real estate, residential real estate industry, and to establish fair rent adjustments for rent stabilized units. Specifically, the board must review, one, the economic condition of the residential real estate industry in New York City, including such factors as the prevailing and projected real estate taxes and sewer and water rates, two, gross operating maintenance costs, including insurance rates, government fees, cost of fuel and labor costs, costs and availability of financing, including effective rates of interest, overall supply of housing accommodations and overall vacancy rates, relevant data from the current and projected cost of living indices of the affected area, and such other data as may be made available to it. In order for the board to meet this mandate, the RGB staff produces a series of annual reports that address each of these required areas of review. There are two reports that measure the annual change in real estate tax costs for owners of rent stabilized buildings the aforementioned price index of operating costs, and our income and expense study, both of which I'll go further into detail. Um, so I'm going to start with the price index of operating costs and how that would be impacted by um, changes in the real estate, uh, any changes that would increase or decrease those um, taxes. The price index of operating costs measures changes in the price of or cost of purchasing a specified set of goods and services used in the operation and maintenance of rent stabilized apartment buildings in New York City. The PIC consists of seven cost components taxes, labor cost, fuel, utilities, maintenance, administrative costs, and insurance costs. The PIC is not unlike the Consumer Price Index, or CPI which measures inflation in a wide range of consumer goods and services, but is designed to only measure those costs incurred by owners of rent-stabilized buildings. The real estate tax component of the PIC accounts for nearly 30% of all of the overall price index, making it the largest operating and maintenance expense for owners. The change in real estate taxes is calculated by providing a list of rent-stabilized properties registered with New York State Homes and Community Renewal to the New York City Department of Finance. Finance matches the list against its records to provide data on assessed value, tax exemptions, and tax abatements for almost 40,000 buildings. This data is used to compute a tax bill for each rent-stabilized building. The change in cost computed for the PIC is simply the percentage difference in aggregate tax bills, tax bills for the current and prior fiscal years. The most current change in real estate tax costs was calculated for the P 2018 PIOC, which measured 6.3% increase from fiscal year 2017 to fiscal year 2018. The overall change for all operating and maintenance costs was 4.5%. So the rise in the 2018 PIOC was driven in large part by the rise in real estate tax expense. Below is a list of seven PIOC cost components the change in cost of each one, and the percentage total of operating expenses for 2018. So you can see there, the first cost is taxes. The change in cost is 6.3%, and the percentage of operating expenses was nearly 30%. Yeah. Um, then we consider labor costs, went up 3.2%. Fuel, 16.4%. That's our highest increase, but it only um, accounts for about 6.4% of that year's price index. Then we consider utilities that rose just 0.5%, maintenance costs, administrative costs, and insurance costs. And the overall change was 4.5%. Excuse me, would water charges be under taxes or would they be under utilities? Utilities. Utilities. Yeah. Thank you. 
So what would the effect of a significant decline in real estate tax costs have on the PINC? All things being equal, a decline in real estate taxes will lessen the rate of growth of the overall PIOC for at least a single year. However, the exact impact would be dependent on changes in costs of the other six expenditure components. While the decline in real estate taxes does not ensure that the PIOC will grow at a slower rate than the previous year, the exact rate of change of the overall PIOC is dependent on the rate of change in all seven cost components. A decline in any single component, such as taxes, slows the rate of growth. For illustrative purposes, I have calculated the impact of a 10% decline in real estate taxes for the 2018 PIOC, with all other components changes the same. By substituting a 10% decline for the 6.3% increase in taxes, the overall change in costs would go from 4.5% increase to a slight decrease of 0.3%. For comparison, if you assume the same 10% decline in real estate tax costs in the 2016 PIOC, which measured an actual 7.5% increase in taxes, but a 1.2% decline in total costs, the total change in costs would have been a decline of 5.9%. The impact of a decline in real estate costs is clearly dependent on the changes in all other costs measured in the PIOC. Overall operating and maintenance costs will not necessarily decline as a result of a significant decrease in real estate taxes, but will always rise at a slower rate. Note that a decline in real estate taxes affects the PIOC in two ways. There is an immediate one-time effect of a tax bill that is lower than the year before, as illustrated in the example I previously noted, where a 10% decrease in taxes was substitute for the actual increase of 6.3% in 2018, and thereby lowering the, the overall PISC by 4.8 percentage points. But there's a longer-term effect of lowering the relative importance of taxes as a proportion of overall O&M expenses. When the relative importance of a cost category lessens, the price change from year to year has less of an impact on the overall PIOC. Note that if over time real estate taxes rise at a faster rate than other cost components, taxes will rise in relative importance. So now that the board has this price index, um, how does that affect the renewal lease guidelines that they promulgate every year? Well, throughout its history, the RGB has used a series of formulas known as commensurate rent adjustments to help determine annual rent guidelines for rent-stabilized apartments. In essence, these commensurates combine various data concerning operating costs, revenues, and an inflation into a single measure to determine how much rents would have to change for net operating income in rent-stabilized buildings to remain constant. For net, net operating income, or NOI, refers to the earnings that remain after O&M expenses are paid, but before payments of income tax and debt service. For example, let's assume the total income of an apartment unit is $1,000 per month. If operating costs for the unit were $600 per unit, the NOI would be $400. The commensurate formulas attempt to calculate how much rent would have to be adjusted to keep that NOI at $400 in, in absolute fixed dollars. Each of these formulas rely in part on a change in the operating costs experienced in rent-stabilized apartments from year to year as computed by the PIOC. As noted earlier, about 30% of the change in the PIOC is due to changes in real estate taxes. Where, where taxes to decrease, the proportion of taxes of overall operating and maintenance costs would most likely decrease as well. In all, there are five separate formulas. The 2018 increase in the PIOC was 4.5%, yielding one-year lease renewal adjustments ranging from 1.75% to 4.5%, and two-year lease renewal adjustments ranging from 3% to 7 and a quarter. Had taxes declined 10% instead of rising 6.3%, the commensurate formulas would yield a range of one-year lease renewals from negative 3% uh, to negative 0.2%, and for a two-year lease, negative 2.5% to uh, positive 2%. However, 
The commensurate rent formula is be, may best be thought of as a starting point for deliberations. The board members are not obligated to set renewal lease adjustments based solely on these formulas. The data presented in other rent guidelines board annual research reports, such as the income and expense study and the income and affordability studies, along with public testimony, can be used in conjunction with these various commensurates to determine appropriate rent adjustments. Therefore, it is not possible to definitively define the impact of a potential decline in real estate tax expense in absolute terms. However, it is likely it would dampen any upward change in real lease, renewal lease adjustments for at least a single year. So there's one other study that takes a look at the impact of real estate taxes that the board uses. It's the Rent Guidelines Board Income and Expense Study. And in 1999, the RGB acquired a new, this data source that has greatly expanded the information based used in the rent adjustment setting process. It's real property income and expense statements from rent stabilized buildings collected by the New York, City, New York City Department of Finance. RPIE data encompasses both revenue and expenses, allowing the board to accurately gauge the overall economic condition of New York City's rent stabilized housing stock. By using consecutive RPIE filings from an ident identical set of buildings, a longitudinal comparison can also be made that illustrates changes in conditions over a two-year period. RGB staff presents and analyzes this data in our annual income and expense study. It is important to note that owners are not required to file real estate tax expense on the RPIE filings. However, for the purposes of our study, the Department of Finance calculates that tax expense for each building included in our analysis and is part of the overall operating and maintenance expense quantified in this report. Perhaps the two most significant measures calculated in this report are owner's operating and maintenance cost to income um, ratio and the longitudinal change in owner's net operating income. One way to evaluate the financial conditions of New York City's stabilized housing stock is by measuring a ratio of expenses to revenues. Traditionally, the RGB has used the cost-income ratio to assess the overall health of the stabilized housing stock, assuming that buildings are better off by spending a lower percentage of revenue on expenses. The cost-to-income ratio is calculated by dividing the average cost per unit per month by the average income. In the most current report, which represents RPIE filings from 2017 for the 2016 calendar year, the, Austin, the cost income ratio was 63.4%. If real estate tax expense was 10% less, the ratio would have been 61.5%. As mentioned earlier, NOI refers to earnings that remain after O&M expenses are paid, but before payments of income tax and debt service. Since average actual collected income grew more than operating costs, citywide NOI and rent stabilized buildings increased by 4.4% in 2016. If real estate tax expense was 10% less, the increase in the NOI would have been 8.2%. As I stated earlier, it is not possible to definitively define the impact of potential decline in real estate tax expense in absolute terms. However, lower cost to income ratios and higher growth in NOI due to reduction in tax expense would most likely lead to a dampening and renewal lease adjustments for rent stabilized departments in New York City. Great, thank you. <coughs> Questions from the commission? James? So, um, turn that, the, turn uh, that on. Has the rent guidelines board ever approved a decline? In Allowable. Sorry, has the Rent Guidelines Board ever approved a decline in allowable uh, rent increases? No. Um, in 2015 and 16, there was a rent freeze on one-year lease renewals, um, but that is low as our board has ever gone. So there's never been um, – another way of asking that is, uh, has there ever been a decline in the uh, expenses? Yes. There has been. Um, could I think you, the could largest, you elaborate on when yeah, that was and what the, what the relationship to the allowable rent increase was? Right. Um, so I believe the lowest decline, we, it's only happened two to three times in the history of this report, which goes back to 1969. Um, so I think twice 
um, it declined. The, the, the largest decline was 1.2%, and that was recent. I want to say that was in 2016, and that resulted in a rent freeze for a one-year lease. Um, the other declines are when the price index is, tends to be lower, those, um, the renewal lease adjustments are dampened. Um, so it's prior to this current administration, the lowest the board had ever gone was two and four. But historically, the board has sort of been, um, or, in, or past boards, have taken a look at all the data, including expense data. Uh, we look at tenant income and affordability. We take a look at housing supply. We take a look at mortgage interest rates as well. Um, we hear testimony from invited group, you know, experts and the public at large. Um, so if costs go up a lot, they tend to have um, significant, for example, I believe right after 9-11 um, and the tax year from 03 to 04 where the tax rate was changed in Albany, we saw growth of 16, 70 percent in expense in one year for owners. But that didn't translate into one year guidelines of 12 percent, I believe they were 4 percent and 7 percent that year. Um, so the board will take a look at all the different circumstances that are happening and come up with guidelines. So when expenses really spike, they tend to uh, maybe not compensate owners for that particular year. But where expenses are low or change or have gone up or decline, they may give some increase to owners, um, sort of a, a smoothing effect. Um, so that's sort of happened historically on the board. In more recent years, there's, I think, been an effort, um, you know, to have low guidelines and to have um, last year's price index saw an increase of 4.5% when our current renewal, they resulted in renewal adjustments of 1.5% for one year lease and 2.5% for two year lease. So there's all these different factors that go in. It's not just the growth or decline mm -hmm. in expenses. Um, could I ask a, a question about um, the legal authority, which I'm trying to understand, because the title is Guidelines. Okay, so what happens if an owner just decides to ignore the guideline? Um, you mean and in, in give an increase that's larger than it's allowed by our board? Right. Oh, okay. Um, there, there's an enforcement mechanism. It's through the state agency, Homes and Community Renewal, which is, you know, Division of Housing and Community Renewal. Um, so their enforcement, and there'll be penalties if the owner overcharge a tenant. Um, and if it's deliberate, then there's um, something called treble damages, where the owner has to pay more back to the tenant than what they've overcharged. If it was found not to be deliberate, it would just be returning the amount that they I, overcharged. I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out, since mostly these have been about going up, I'm trying to figure out whether how sticky, we're all trying to figure out how sticky downward um, right. this process might be. So I'm, I so if an know owner what power and authority comes from the Rent Guidelines Board if they say um, that all the data indicate that rents should be coming down because taxes are coming down. What authority is there to make that happen? Well, it would be up to the members of the board to make that happen. Do we leg can we legally give a decrease in rent? Um, we've never done that before. Um, I, I believe the board can. Um, whether well, it's a legal challenge to that, which very well, we, we often get sued, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, I believe it in this. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, never lost. Um, so, from that aspect, the board members control that. They can decide, yes, there's going to be a uh, rent rollback, as maybe referred to. Um, but enforcement of our guidelines, of that rollback, is not our purview. We don't have any enforcement. Um, okay, so you the state depend, does. You depend on the state. We the depend state. on the state. Right. Yes. 
Sorry to be late, folks. I'm Ray Majeski, Chief Economist, City Council Finance. Um, let me, I mean, I want to get an idea of to what extent what you're doing actually applies, because we've heard a lot about preferential rent, uh, which is places where, they're, uh, places where they're charging less than the legally maximum rent. And I presume what you're doing is setting the changes of the legally maximum rent. Um, how important is preferential rent in all of this? Well, so if our guidelines one and a half percent, and and someone has a legal rent of eighteen hundred, and um, they're being charged a preferential rent of thirteen hundred, upon renewal, right now, as the state law allows them to go up to that eighteen hundred dollars. So our guideline, in effect, has not and does not control increases in that particular unit until it gets to that eighteen hundred dollar mark. Um, Some of that has always been there. If, if a legal rent reaches market, then our guidelines not going to matter because they're not going to be able to get something more than what the market bears. Um, probably in the more current reality that we face today, um, because the markets are going up so much that those preferential rents have come are more to bear than they have in the past. Uh, so we have less of an in, clearly less or no impact on preferential. Um, you know, now they, when they register the unit though, they they can put our increase on the legal amount. So our legal the legal amount would go up one and a half percent if they if that preferential doesn't reach the legals the contract rent of whatever that tenant would have. But it would the owner can still use that one and a half percent to on the legal amount when they register the unit. Just to follow up, is that, do you think that preferential rents are important enough that we need to be thinking about them when we're thinking about the effect of, you know, property taxes on rent-stabilized units? Um, I guess it's the impact of what you want to do, right? If the intent is if the intent is to take a look at tax reform um, where there is a reduction in class two properties in their real estate taxes and you want that to trickle down to tenants, yeah, the preferential becomes an important part of that because that may not happen with what what you're you know trying to accomplish here. So Yes, I guess, is what I'm saying. Andrew, can I just, um, Gary, can I just break in there to add a clarifying question on this? What, do you have information about what share of preferential rents are not preferential because they are income restricted, right? Many 420, 421A units, for example, would be preferential rents, right? Most, yeah. Most of them. I would, I would so, say that for the most part. So those are regulated in other ways, right? Um, what share of the rent, of the preferential rents, do you think are accountable or attributable to those kinds of other restrictions? I, I, I don't know. I'd have to try to. It's a, that's a, a neat number to get to, right? <laughs> Um, I'm not sure if we can get to that or not, but we, we could try to do that. Um, there's a lot of different other factors because of uh, just where the market is, whether we can determine if it's market or if the owner is determining the preferential. Um, but not, not, not today anyway. I don't have that number. And, uh, sim along similar lines, what I was curious about is when you do your analysis for the PIOC and everything, is it done using the legal rent as kind of the income when you conduct all your tests, or are you using the preferential rent when you? Well, the price index is just a measure of change in cost, so that that's not something that includes income. Um, the the other report, the income and expense study, Correct. when you, the when title you, when says, you, yeah, there's income there that's reported by owners on the RPIE, um, and it's what's what 
what the owner reports. So it's what the owner is actually charging. It's the it's the profit. what they or, or I shouldn't say charging what they received over the course of the calendar year, which would you know if there was some sort of collection problem with the rent and they you know it's actually what they've actually received in rental income. Can I, uh, Alan? Did you have a James? Mm -hmm. In, in the, in the uh, index that you publish and in the analysis of, of um, incomes and in the recommendations that the board makes or the decision that the board makes for uh, rent increases, um, all of these are in terms of uniform uh, rates and costs that apply across the board. Is that true? For the most part, yes, but there has been, the, the board has done, um, adjustments that target certain parts of the rental stock, uh, rent stabilized stock. For example, back in 2008, um, there was, um, For apartments, essentially renting for under a thousand dollars, there was a percentage and there was a, a dollar amount that could be taken. I believe it was forty-five dollars or four and a half percent. So the cutoff was so the owner could choose a forty-five dollar increase on rent or a percentage increase. In rent. So the mark was ended up being a thousand bucks. So. A four and a half percent increase on a thousand dollars is going to give you more than forty-five dollars. So rents below that, it offered the owner to take those forty-five dollar. Um, so in essence, then you are that's not across the board sort of situation. Although it was across all the units in all the city, but units renting for under a thousand were subject to that fixed could be subject to that fixed dollar amount, um, and that was due. At the time, the board thought there was rent skewing, that, uh, that their lower rents weren't covering operating expenses, so they felt like there was more of a, mm -hmm. should be more of an increase <clears throat> on the lower. And they've done similar things throughout the history of the board. Um, not very much recently, and in most years, it's a, across the board, a percentage increase. Um, there's always a percentage increase, but they can also um, do, do other adjustments mm -hmm. along those lines. So, so if, uh, as a result of uh, changes that are made, there are decreases in property taxes on rental properties, but um, not uniform across the board. So some properties may benefit greater than others. Right. Would the uh, Rent Guidelines Board take that into account and consider um, differential ways to apply uh, proposed guidelines? I don't know. Um, it's not something the board has discussed before. Is it something the board um, would consider perhaps if it comes down um, that that's the case? Um, it's not outside your authority. That was a question. When, whenever we get a new idea on the board, I don't want to say it is or isn't without making sure that the board can do it. So that's not something the board has considered before. For example, board cannot set adjustments based on tenant income. Mm -hmm. It can't be done. Yeah. So in this situation, we'd, we'd have to take a close look to see whether the board can do that or not. Um, I'm not coming up with any reason why they couldn't right now, but I don't want to publicly state that the board could or couldn't do that at this point. It does sound, though, if I understand the the uh, example you gave from 2008, that the board did exactly that on a prior occasion where it decided to um, uh, provide uh, land, provide a greater increase to landlords with units that rented for under $1,000. Yeah, that was a they case, certainly... There was a case where there was a recommendation for a differential effective 
rent increase. Yes. I mean, the board has done differential rents increases in the past, but um, whether the board and, uh, you know, there's a legal aspect and the, um, the ability to actually enforce or to be able to figure out how the guideline would be worded for that to be do what it wants to do and to make sure, you know, if the, if the board is saying owners who have a significant or certain percentage reduction in the real estate taxes are going to get in a lower adjustment or no adjustment or a decline or something along those lines, it would have to be a way that the board would actually have to be able to write a guideline that the state would be able to enforce, would be able to um, administer that as well. So... Um, but it would have to be, you know, something the board could talk about, consider, mm -hmm. sure, certainly. Uh, just one final thing on that. Is, so in 2008, were there any legal challenges to the, to the action yes. of differential increases? Yes. And, and what were the outcomes? Um, with the board, the, the guidelines stayed as they were. They would, you know, the city defended the, the board's actions, and they remained at um, that four and a half and eight and a half. It's a... Casado case that was went on for. I think it wasn't settled to 2011. It was a long one, yeah. Um, but yeah, ultimately it was determined that the board could do that illegally. So. Um, Andrew, let let me ask you uh, while we're on this authority question. Let me ask you a thought experiment. And obviously, the questions that the commission asks are to help inform our deliberations. They don't necessarily show what our thinking is as a commission. Um, but would the RGB have the power to say um, the, t the rent bill that goes to the tenant should include the share, the actual amount of that rent that is going towards property taxes? I, I don't know. I've, uh, we've never done anything like that before. It's usually something that um, is done at the state level. I, I don't know the answer to that. I'd have to look into that. I don't. I don't know whether the board can can require owners to do that or not. Well, let let me ask you a broader question about sort of the salience of the tax. What you sit through innumerable public hearings where you're hearing from the both the landlords and the tenants about their expenses. Do you hear much from the tenants? about the effect of the taxes on the rents that they're paying? I don't think, <laughs> I've been doing this 20 plus years, I've, I don't think I've ever heard testimony where a tenant has come up and said that. Our rents are going taxes up because the city sailing. is increasing right. taxes. Yeah. No, that, I don't think that's ever been stated. I, I don't know. I'm not sure the understanding of it on, on, on the tenant side, whether they understand a lowering in real estate taxes would impact. I'm not sure, but I've never heard testimony. Okay. Um, other questions for Andrew? Um, I just want to clarify one thing so that the record is clear. When you, when you say in your testimony a couple of times um, it would dampen, for example, on page four, it would dampen any upward change for at least a single year. And is my understanding correct that you're hedging on that single year because in future years the, the index being dependent upon the share of a particular expense could change depending upon those other expense items? Right, and, and you know, real estate taxes inevitably are gonna go up. <laughs> They're not gonna stay. Um, so we're looking at a year to year. So say there's a 10% decline, a 15% decline, whatever it is, um, which would, would have an impact certainly in future years of the, um, the weight that taxes gather. But it's still going to be the largest expense. So if the following year there was a 3% rise in real estate taxes, that's going to impact the price index. So if you're just looking at a change in costs, now that 3% would have had a more, of a more of an impact on the overall price if nothing was done the prior year to, because it's gonna be a smaller proportion. Mm -hmm. um, 
but if there's an increase um, now if there was a tax that was phased in maybe that would you would see multiple years of impact from the price index of decline so instead of having one large decline you may have you know smaller declines in real estate taxes over those years and it would affect less yeah mm -hmm. okay Yes, Carol. Mm -hmm. uh, I have one last question. I'd like to try to understand. Maybe I mis, uh, misinterpreted something you said. You've got a price index, and you've got an expense statement, income expense statement. But I had the feeling that you said, then the board convenes, and they look at a whole bunch of other things as well. Mm -hmm. Can I push on what those whole bunch of other things are? Sure. Do they involve... Mm -hmm. um, vacancies or 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 um, warehousing of of apartments or complaints or what do they what are the mitigating factors that could completely send the numerical data in a whole other direction right so um, there's our staff reports we do every year. The price index of operating costs and the income and expense study deal with expense and income for owners. We also have a tenant income and affordability um, study that takes a look at factors that tenants face, such as unemployment, um, you know, uh, salaries. Uh, we take a look at the city's economy. We take all these different factors that would impact tenant income or and their ability to afford their rents. Um, then we have one that deals with housing supply, how much housing supply is out there and what, you know, what types of housing um, are being built, what's available, you know, vacancy, um, a lot of data from the housing vacancy survey that we use um, that the board looks at, which is Beyond an important... Beyond stabilized units. Yeah. Yeah. They're rent stabilized, the, right. The so, non-stabilized universe. I'm sorry, say that again? The non-stabilized universe. We take a look at that, yeah. Um, you know, we would certainly give the board information about that. Um, so then, you know, uh, then we have another report that takes a look at the changes in the stabilized stock itself, what's coming into it, what's leaving it. Uh, so those are our reports. We do memos. If the board members have a particular issue they want to deal with that year, we'll do research, produce memos for the board. But we also hear testimony from owners and, and, and tenants as well. And if there's a particular year, um, there's something, uh, that comes up, um, that the board will it may also influence with the board. You know, preferential rents are a discussion the board has had over the last two or three years, certainly, or okay. more, of the impact of that. Um, so ultimately, it's a vote. So we have nine members on the board. It's not a formula. Rent control increases our formulas. Um, our board, it's a vote. So they bring not only what we give them, but testimony from experts, housing experts, and government folks and the public at large, and then they bring their own experience to the table as well. So all those things come to So that's why it's it's not possible for me to say that a 10% decline in taxes will result in a 2% a, uh, decline in one year. You know, they'll charge a rollback of 2% for one year. It's not something that I can numerically figure out. I appreciate it. Thank God. <laughs> can I... Um Go back to something else you mentioned about the PAOC. You said sure. that the taxes account for about 30% mm -hmm. of the index. Mm -hmm. And although <clears throat> the impact of taxes will adjust based with the other costs in a given year, has that percentage hovered around 30%? In, in probably um, over the last, I'd have that, this is off the top of my head, so don't take It's certainly taken on a big proportion than it ever has simply because of the the rise in real estate taxes for class two properties have just um, between probably starting in that 02, 03, 04 year where there was a that fiscal year where that was a large jump in the tax rate in Albany and then the increased assessed values of these properties it, it was probably around 20 21 percent at one point and now it's up to 30 percent so it's, it's, and have it's definitely you, has been a larger share. Have you looked at all um, at the how that compares to other cities or other? You know, we're trying to get some data on that. In fact, um, 
I, I spoke to someone at finance about that. Um, mm -hmm. So we may be able to get an idea of where that. I, I think New York is somewhat of a unique animal when it comes to that in terms of expenses. I think the real estate tax part of it is probably um, more significant in the city than in other parts of this other country, or most other parts of the country. But I, that's my sense anyway, but I could, I could be wrong in that. But uh, we're trying to get some data on that. Do you capture all rent-stabilized units in co-ops and condos with the R RPIEs? The stabilized, it's not, it, we, hmm. No, we don't take co-op and condo. We don't take co-op and condo in RPIEs. Okay. And uh, is there a legal authority to use the RPIE for rent guideline, for the rent guidelines board? Yeah, we get summary data, so we're not, um, we're not using, there's a privacy issue with the RPIE data. So they just give us summary data, and so there's no, there's no problem with us using it. Um, but yeah, finance has you know, been gracious enough since 1990 to you know, summarize data for us that the board can use, yeah. But we don't have, produce any, any, anything we have wouldn't jeopardize the privacy issues of the RPIE. In setting, in setting the increase in rents annually, what's your mandate? Is there uh, something that you're supposed to specifically achieve in it? I ask this because you guys sound like the Federal Reserve, which has all the stuff they look at, but also do have a mandate for what they're supposed to do, and that lets us, to some extent, estimate what they're going to do. Um. In the testimony, it's the it's it's written out there what they have to consider. Um, a mandate, you know. Um, the idea of rent stabilization it was never. It, it didn't start as an affordable housing program. It happens to be where most of the affordable units are, but it was sort of to create a more a fair market where there wasn't one. Um, and the board is probably mandated to figure out, okay, if there was a normal market, if vacancy was 8 or 9% and it was working like it's supposed to, rents would go up or adjust, be adjusted by, I hate to use go up, but adjusted by X. Does it always reach that mandate? I, you know, that's, it's a very difficult thing, I must say, that in my years of being on the Rent Guidelines Board and all the different boards that I've dealt with, they, they all very much take this to heart, a serious job and understand the complexities of trying to do that. And it's not an easy job. And there's people on the fringe, you know, the poorer tenants and the owners who can't meet expenses are usually suffer the more, most for those things. But they try to do what they can to create, to create that. So I, I think, what they're mandated to look at and what they're mandated to do, um, you know, where it's, as I guess it's slightly different, but uh, that's, that's the idea behind it anyway. Thank you so much, Andrew, um, both for uh, illuminating this complicated issue for all of us and, and for your service on My pleasure. So thank you. So we're going to turn next to <clears throat> Professor Merriman. Thanks. <clears throat> Uh, um, slides. Oh, they can. Good. So I have uh, I have just uh, a, a much shorter, just about five minute, uh, seven minute presentation, um, and I very much appreciate the opportunity to be here and uh, to talk to you and to to learn about this issue, and hope um, I can uh, help. Uh, the the commission work on its very very difficult task. So. Um, First of all, um, I think you should think of this as an alien economist from the planet Cook County, Illinois, parachuting into New York City and landing in the middle of an advisory commission on property tax reform meeting. And uh, as I was thinking about doing this, uh, I was frankly humbled and a bit confused. So um, 
I'm humbled because, uh, as I think it should be clear just from, uh, it, from the last presentation, this is a massive and complex system with many parts and a very long history. There's economic considerations, there's political considerations, there's transition issues. All of that is very daunting for the commission to try and figure out the best ways to move forward. And it's also humbling because there are many smart, intelligent, diligent people who have been working on this problem. And so I'm sort of an outsider coming in. And so what I, I think I can best do is sort of tell you my reactions as somebody who's thought about property taxes for a long time, studied a lot of property taxes. When I look at the New York property tax system, what is it that I see? What is it that I find confusing? So th there's many things that about the system that frankly don't seem to me to have a clear rationale. Like I, I look at it and I think, well, why would you want to do that? So the first thing, and I, I'm a big believer in transparency in taxes. You want people to know what taxes they are. And I've spent a lot of time trying to explain to people how the property tax system works. Many, many students and many, many people, legislators, people in the general public. The first thing I find a little bit confusing is, or seems unnecessary is you have class-specific tax rates and class-specific assessment rates, and then you multiply them by each other and you use the product of that to determine what the tax bill is, right? But all you need is the product. You don't need both the assessment rates and the tax rates. So it seems like it would be at least a little easier to understand if you got rid of one of them, right? And I know that's probably not as simple as it seems. I can do it on a blackboard. Um, the second thing is that there are assessment limits, as I understand it, that are quite large and that they last a long time. And it's not clear what the rationale is for the size of the assessment limits or for the time that it takes for the assessment limits to phase out or what's really the goal of the assessment limits. So again, I think the commission is going to have to think about that issue and whether there, it might be possible to think about, again, go back to kind of the basics. What are the goals? Um, a big issue that, that really stands out when you look at this from afar is that condominiums, co-ops, class two properties are assessed at 45% of market value, while owner-occupied homes are assessed at 6% of market value. But both these kinds of real estate, their purpose is basically shelter. So again, you wonder, why would you want to assess these so differently, right? What's the rationale for that? Um, why, would you, why wouldn't you treat them pretty much as the same thing? Whatever, whatever the public purpose is in having a property tax, it would seem, you know, I'm sure there are things I don't quite understand, but other than the kind of historical reasons, what's the public purpose of having these different kinds of assessment rates? Um, the fourth bullet point is, okay, so even if you want assessment limits and you want to phase them in, when there's a sale, you've got a, presumably an informed buyer and an informed seller, they're going to the market. They can capitalize the, whatever change will happen as a result of the assessment limit. So you'd think, I would think, you at least in a lot of other places, those kind of things would reset on sale, right? And you'd go back up to market value or at least market value times the assessment limit in terms of term in determining the value of the property. So again, that's something I would think that the commission might want to scrutinize and think about what's the rationale? Why not have those things reset on sale? And lastly, I, so I, I was very fortunate in that I was able to, um, although I know very little about the New York City property tax system now, I knew even less about two weeks ago, but I've been watching the videos from the early meetings and from some of the, uh, some of the public hearings, pu the public talking about it. And as I, I watched that, I was struck by the fact that um, when I looked at the data, Class four pays almost half of property taxes. It has 25% of market value. These are business properties. But most of the discussion seems to be around residential properties. And, you know, property taxes are a really important 
uh, element, as we saw certainly with apartments, but a certainly an important element of economic development in the city. So you want to think about how you use those property taxes to affect, to structure economic development, and to think about are those, is that the right level of taxes on business, and how should those taxes be structured? So that's a, another issue. So in just thinking about any kind of property tax reform, and, and New York in particular, I think, you know, I have a few general principles that I, I, I again, the commission might want to think about. So any tax discount, any abatement to one group will cause an increase in taxes paid by other, uh, other groups in a revenue-neutral environment. And I know the mandate of the commission is to come up with a revenue-neutral proposal. So of course, that also works the other way. If, if, uh, if you increase taxes for one group, then uh, you can lower taxes more across the board. And so as we talk about particular abatements, you have to kind of trace it through the whole system. The second thing is, that the property tax system, in its essence, it's really a pretty simple idea, right? You're taxing the market value of real estate. It's a measure of wealth. You want to tax that, at least for, for, for homes. We do all kinds of things to get incredibly pop, complicated property tax system, not only in New York City, but in my own home, home city of Chicago. It's also very complicated. And I think we really ought to think about the trade-offs. We want to fix the property tax system. We want to tidy up some corner of it. But that makes it more complex. And the more complex it gets, the more people are fighting about the tax system, the more people don't understand the tax system, the more it gets distorted in political debates. So whatever you can do to make it simple is a real virtue. Finally. In terms of fairness, and I, I know that the mandate of the commission, again, is to make the property tax fair. That, that was really emphasized. And I know it's restricted to the property tax. But you really need to think about the system more broadly of taxes. So you need to think about the fairness of the entire system of taxes, including the progressivity of the income tax, the property tax, the sales tax, all taxes together. And that suggests and I don't know if it's possible, but you can think about, for instance, how circuit breakers interact with the property tax system. You might not, some of the, the recommendations, or at least the thought, might go into thinking, OK, what's the, what's the entire system of taxes that we want to think about? So I'll stop there. I'm glad to talk about uh, other issues. I know one of the issues uh, that was talked about was uh, something that came up in the last session. Uh, last speaker about um, how does uh, how might uh, changes in property taxes on rental properties uh, come back to to renters, and we could talk about that as well. So thank you, Professor Borden. Why don't we also uh, get your thoughts out, and then we can then we can open it up to questions more generally. Great. Yeah, thank, thank you, and, and thank you, uh, Chairman Chairman Bean, for inviting me to be here. Um, as uh, Chair Bean mentioned, I'm a professor at Brooklyn Law School. My focus is federal income tax, but I look at the transactional aspects of tax, what affects um, different decisions about making transactions, how these transactions are structured. And so uh, maybe say a little bit about how property tax might fit in to some of these decision makings. <clears throat> uh, now, I'm not an empiricist, so I don't look at the data. Um, I, do, I do advise property owners of various sorts, uh, the owners, investors, developers, uh, managers on how they structure um, dispositions and acquisitions of property, how they structure the ownership of the property. <clears throat> um, so yeah, property tax would become a cost in some of the decisions uh, that, uh, or, or, yeah, a factor, cost factor in decisions that property owners are making, whether to buy or to sell. Um, whether a person is making a decision to invest in the property, they're going to take into account the cost of the property tax. So I guess some of the comments that I make will be sort of more anecdotal, uh, things that I see as I, as I work with different people, as I study and as I think about how um, tax affects these decision makings, the, uh, the decisions that are being made. So and, and, and as we're talking about this, the transaction can be complicated. 
ownership arrangement structures can vary from transaction to transaction, from property to property, and then also the different types of parties involved may want different types of structures. There are some general structures that, that we see, um, and there are some general issues that we see across the board. And so I guess when we're talking about real estate transactions, uh, maybe talking about three classes, three or four classes of parties, you have homeowners, um, developers, and managers of property, and then also investors. People are bringing money into the deal and bringing the capital into the deal and making the, making the deal possible. Um, so if you're talking about homeowners, um, they're, if you're thinking about how property taxes could affect home ownership, um, higher property taxes, I guess we would anticipate, would drive down values and affect values. So and I think maybe one thing that we can look at in this area is how the, the change in federal tax law is affecting home values. Uh, there's a cap now on the amount of property tax that's deductible at the federal level. Um, it's going to affect um, people, maybe not so much in the city, but in, in, in areas around the city. And we can see if there is any effect on property values that's resulting from this change. Um, you know, so far, there's again, it's, it's sort of anecdotal. People are talking about uh, maybe the markets are slowing down in areas where there are higher property taxes and, and the values may be affected. Um, at the federal level, we also have the home mortgage interest deduction. There's also an exclusion of gain on the sale of a principal residence. And we can think about whether these, I guess, some of the ideas behind these is they help to encourage home ownership. Um, there's a question about who actually benefits from these tax breaks. Do the benefits go to the, 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 to, to the lenders? Are they going to the real estate professionals who are getting higher commissions on sales of property? Or, or um, are the benefits actually going to the homeowners? So I guess the same thing in the inverse would apply as we think about um, how property tax may affect home ownership and, and values of home. And, and maybe, I, I guess, if we look at the federal level, some of the um, thinking behind some of these benefits, perhaps we value home ownership, perhaps it helps create stable communities. And I guess on the property tax side, there would be a question about whether higher property taxes would destabilize communities. I think if you look at some of the in, in suburban areas where the property taxes are higher, I think the idea is, you know, we get, we're, we're paying higher property taxes, but we're getting um, better services, whether it's education or, or whatever it is. So um, the, 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 the services will help stabilize where maybe property taxes would uh, perhaps cause destabilization. From an in investor standpoint, an investor um, investors, and we're talking about investors, and we're talking about development. Um, investors are, are in the parts that have substantial amounts of money. If we're talking about a development in New York City, obviously, it's, it's going to be um, a significant capital outlay. It's talking to somebody who's doing a development in another part of the country and said, this is a big development. It's $300 million, which, of course, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't really impress us, right? Um, so where, where is the capital coming from? It's coming from insurance companies. Um, it may be coming from pension plans, endowments, and other um, sources where there's large capital to be invested. And the investors are looking for returns, again, that, uh, you know, returns that would impress most of us, 5 or 8%, don't necessarily in impress the investors, or they're looking for, you know, 12 to 15%. They don't want to go into, ne in, into, into deals that don't provide um, that type of return. So. If you're talking about investors, they're, when they're talking about the return, they're, I guess there are a couple of factors that they're looking at. They're looking at how much money they put into the deal, how much money they're going to get out of the deal, and how long is it going to take to get the money out. Um, the time value of money becomes important. Um, they, want to, they want the cash in and the cash out to be as close together as possible, and they want the return to be as high as possible. So when we're talking about the, the, the difference between property tax um, on rental property and the property tax on um, owner-occupied property. An investor coming in, if, if it's going to be a, a condo deal, then there would be investment construction and then sell of the units as quickly as possible and that would, that would provide a return. If we're talking about property being leased, um, there are different models here, but if it's property that's going to be um, built for rent, then um, investors may come in, put the money in, expect the property to be built reach a point of stabilization, which may be 70%, 80%, 90% um, occupied. And then at that point, there would be some refinancing. You would cash out the initial investor. And, and how would property tax, again, property tax, if you're building for sale, 
property tax may affect the, the, the sell price, which in turn would affect the um, return on investment that the investors are getting. It may make a deal more or less attractive when you're talking about property that's built for sale. Um, again, it's going to be the, the owner-occupied type. If you're talking about increasing the property tax on that type of property, then that would we would expect that to um, suppress the sell price, and um, it may make it harder for developers to obtain the, the capital. If it's for rent property, again, the, the, there, there is some value to be obtained in buying property that's stabilized and then receiving the rent over a period of time and then selling the property. But if you're talking about new construction, typically the, the biggest jump in value is going to be you take, if it's raw land, you take raw land, you develop it, you stabilize it. There's a big jump in value from going from raw land to a stabilized rental property. And so investors are looking to get in at the beginning and then get out as soon as it's stabilized. And there would be different sort of um, calculations that are done for the, for the capital coming in after stabilization. Um, and and there, there's a question about if, if, the, if, the, if the property tax on rental property is decreased, and we're talking about new construction, who's going to gain the benefit from that? It's possible that the benefit could go to the developers and the investors. Um, we talked about the ROI. If the rent stays constant, if it's determined by market forces and, and, the, and the property tax doesn't necessarily affect rent, rents can stay constant. The owners and managers of the property looking for an ROI, if they don't have to pay as much in, in property tax, then their net rental income will increase. Um, they can pay more for the property and get the, the same ROI, which means that the benefit may go to the um, developers and the, and the initial investors. So, so developers and managers, uh, they typically make their money in, in one of two ways. When you're talking about investors coming in, they put the money in, they're passive, put the money in, they get money out at the end. Um, with a developer, developer typically, and managers typically charge fees um, percent of assets under management is often a formula that they use. So they'll charge a fee, they'll get paid on an annual basis the fee, and then they'll also get a share of the profits at the back end. Um, it's not unusual for, and they get somewhat complicated um, financial arrangements where there, where there are different profit sharing at different tranches of income. So you may have a situation where if, if you have a, a project that performs at a certain level, all of the profit goes to the investors once they hit a benchmark then the, the profit beyond that point is shared at some level. If you another benchmark, there may be um, a different sharing structure. So you have a situation where developer shares have to hit the benchmark 20% in a certain band of profit, then above that 25%. So the developers, and uh, the same would be true with the manager if you have property that's being um, held for lease, the manager is getting a fee to manage the property, and then at some point if the property is sold, the manager would um, then share in the profits. And so th this is the typical type of sort of joint venture arrangement that we see um, uh, rental property being held in. Uh, we have the manager managing the property, passive investors. And you see these types of arrangements, obviously, with the really large deals. Uh, but even with smaller five to ten unit um, properties, you'll see joint ventures where you have one party managing it and then um, you know, capital coming in from perhaps more typical type of investors, maybe individuals that have the resources to go into a deal that's, that's a few million dollars. Uh, we see, so I guess another, maybe another thing to think about is um, how a change in property tax might affect sort of the, the, the transaction where a person buys a piece of property, people buy a piece of property, the idea is to renovate it. If it's rent stabilized, do the renovation, and then uh, try to charge market rates, um, buy out the stabilized tenants, do the renovation and then um, try to increase the, the, the amount of rent. And, and again, property tax, who benefits there? Um, there it may be, it's, we, we go back to the same ROI type of calculation. If the amount of income at the back end is gonna be more uh, because the rent is lower, is that passed on to the current owner? Is it passed on to the developer that's doing the renovation? Um, does it get passed on to the, to the person who ends up in the, in the property? So I think with, with that, that's sort of an overview of the type of, of structures that, that people do. Um, again, I don't have empirical evidence or data that, that talks about the effect that 
property tax has on these decisions is going to be a cost and a factor that um, all of these parties would consider in making decisions about whether to invest, what, when to sell, and um, rates of charge. Yeah. Thank you uh, very much. So um, we'll open it up to questions from the commissioners. Um, let, let me just start with, uh, you know, sort of two, I guess, benchmarks in terms of, of your experience across the United States. Um, so, for example, Professor Merriman, you, you mentioned well, why aren't we more concerned about the commercial, the business property taxes that make up half of the revenue? Um, obviously, there's a difference in the tax rate, the effective tax rate that's charged to uh, owner owned residential, rental residential, and then business property. Do you have a sense across the country of what that differential between residential and business property typically is? Well, okay, so uh, first of all, in very large cities, mm -hmm. it's much higher than, you know, in suburban areas or, or, or other kinds of areas. And generally in booming cities, it's higher than in cities that are doing less well. So if you look at a Cleveland or a St. Louis, where the economy is weaker, you see business tax rates that are similar in terms of market value to commercial rates. But if you look at a place like Chicago, which I'm quite familiar in New York, New York's still, you know, on the upper fringe, but, um, you, you know, my understanding is that basically the, the more the demand for business locations in big cities, the more, the, the relative amount that they pay relative to homeowners goes up. So in New York, uh, I mean, in Chicago, it's roughly the assessment rates are the rate. There's only one rate for the various classes. The assessment is three and a half times on commercial property versus residential property. It's the I can't remember the exact math, but it's certainly higher than that in New York City. Um, and uh, so so, yeah. <laughs> three and a half times yes Alan professor uh, you had mentioned something about looking uh, with uh, circuit breakers looking at uh, other uh, I guess means testing or uh, uh, other ideas well uh, a, a, a circuit breaker or uh, is typically something where you would have a provision in the income tax, and I realize you have a city income tax as well as a state income tax. I don't know what the legal ramifications would be here. But uh, something that would say um, you get a certain credit against your income taxes based on the amount that you pay typically in rent or it could be in mortgage payments. And then that could phase out as your income increased. So, uh, so that it could be progressive in that sense. And the idea is you might have a property tax that was flat or even regressive, but the net effect of those two things together could make it much more progressive. Okay. Uh, did you have any ideas in terms of uh, using uh, the phasing in of increases and decreases as to how to provide some uh, of that similar f uh, philosophy? So what would the, you're asking sort of what would the formula be? Is, is that? It, well, yeah, I mean, I mean, it, it kind of struck me that if you had somebody living in a property that was retired and their, in, their rent was, uh, their uh, property tax was because of gentrification, was gonna skyrocket versus somebody who was living in that property uh, who was well to do, uh -huh. um, you know, should they be treated differently, or could you know, could you envision a scenario where that <clears throat> would pass muster? Uh, yes, I, 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 you know, I think it's uh, you know there are examples around the country where uh, that there is a phase out of the circuit breakers, mm -hmm. and so it certainly wouldn't be unique in New York to to do that. And that if your income was higher, um, you would you would get less of a credit than if your income was lower. 
Um, now that, in the particular example you're talking about with a retired person, it, it, you know, their income might not be a true reflection of what economists call their lifetime income. So that's, that is a concern and a reason for uh, that you might wa not want to do this or you might want to modify it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. To follow up on that, are there particular circuit breaker systems across the country that you think we should be paying particular attention to as a model? Uh, I might be able to get back to you on that. My, my first thought is Minnesota is usually a good place to look for, for any kind of innovative policy. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, going back to the economics, right? So I think we can find a mechanism to do all sorts of things as you've, as, as the, you know, alien. Uh, <laughs> right, <economy. right. laughs> so I remember that incidence, economic incidence is based on elasticity and relative elasticity of demand and supply. Yes. How should we think about that? No, I think that's exactly the way. And actually, I have another slide here. That's exactly the, the thing to think about, is what's, you know, to the, to the extent that you lower property tax, to what extent is that going to lower rents, right? Well, that's going to depend on what's the elasticity of supply and what's the elasticity of demand for rental properties. So in a place like New York, uh, you know, the incidence is, is – uh, it's going to be hard to translate that into lower rents if you have a very constrained property market where, you know, it's a very built-up city. On the other hand, there could be conversions, uh, and over the long term, you're probably going to have a much bigger effect than you are going to ha be, have over the short term. Now, I, I looked a little bit at the literature in terms of what do we know about the incidence of property taxes on rental property. And I have to tell you, I was a little disappointed because there's, there's not a big literature out there. <laughs> what literature there is out there shows that property tax increases at least at – I would say my summary of the literature would be like half of the property tax increase gets translated into renters. But I think it's going to be, first of all, we don't know if it's symmetric. So when you increase property taxes, yes, yeah, some of that's going to get passed along to renters. When you cut it, is that also going to happen or is the time period going to be differently? And then the other thing is I think it's going to be very situation specific, right? It's going to depend upon what is the elasticity in the particular area at the particular time period that you're talking about. I think, you know, the, the general idea is over the long term, elasticities are probably a lot bigger than they are over the short period. But, you know, in terms of explaining it to people, making people feel like it's fair, those short term elasticities matter a lot. And so, so, so that's, I think, I think the, thinking about the elasticity is exactly the right way to think about it. And, and the rental businesses also rent. So Businesses anything, also rent. Uh, are you including? Yeah, so I'm, I'm not aware of actually any studies on that, but you know, the, the same principles would apply. I'd like to follow up on that because we spent a a very interesting and very confusing summer with uh, uh, Lincoln Institute's uh, reader on the property tax of Wallace Oates edited years ago. Uh huh. Um, and. Uh, one of the striking things about New York is the role that the value of land and location and how much of property values, you know, we tax both the improvement and the land slash location, and how much of property values in the city are about that. And one of the clearer things in the literature, in fact, the only thing that's actually clear in the literature is, you know, the incidence of the tax on the land portion of value gets passed on to the owner of land. Now, does the fact that land is so big a story in New, you know, in New York matter in how we think about, among other things, that progressivity story you were asking us to look at and how things pass on? 
Yeah, no, a a absolutely. You know, the, the Lincoln Institute, where I'm also affiliated, right? You know, the big story that, that, that we've been talking about is, right, a tax on land is, first of all, economically efficient. And then you can talk about the, the fairness of a tax on land, but the, we would expect the property tax to be capitalized, in, at least as a first cut into the value of the land. And, you know, undoubtedly, so you know New York much better than I do. Undoubtedly, in Manhattan, I can believe that land values are, you know, a huge chunk of the value of real estate. I guess, at least from what I know, if we talk about places in the Bronx or in Queens or in Staten Island, maybe much less. And certainly, and so I would expect some spillover. There's certainly some substitutability, right? I know that from Brooklyn, right? That mm -hmm. people want to work in Manhattan but want to live in Brooklyn. So, so I don't know that that totally negates the story that the incident's fault, you know, that it has some effect on, uh, let's say, the intensity of development. I, yeah, I, I think, you know, your point there, uh, Dick Netzer thought that the, uh, that the effective tax rate on commercial property in Manhattan was less than the locational rent. So he thought that, you know, the entire, that there was more or less uh -huh. land tax in there, um, even if it wasn't, you know. <laughs> so it does, now, that matters because it does affect both the price of land and what we build. Is that roughly what we want to say? What you'd say there, how we tax and the way land absorbs it is, you know, if land absorbs it, then it doesn't have that, it has less effect on what we build and uh, on, on those cost estimates to the extent that land prices fall. Is that, is that a fair statement? Right. To, to, the extent, to the extent that the in incidences on land, the incidence of the taxes on land, then I have much less concerns about it distorting sort of the economic activity in that area. Okay. Thank you. Could I, could, I just, um, could I just remind us that one of the problems, it seems to me, pro I don't know if it's a problem, it's not really a problem. It's it's a unique uh, quality, I think, of the New York City um, situation, current situation, and it, and it started this morning with the rent guidelines board. Right? We have layers. Uh, w this is not a perfect market, right? <laughs> I, I, to, to put it mildly, right? Right. It's a highly segmented market. Parts of it are tightly controlled, parts of it are not controlled. Zoning overlays everything we've created, uh, a market in air rights, so land isn't as fixed or, and site, let's put it that way, site value is not fixed, site value is cl climbs. So given, you've got a bunch of economists sitting here, okay. but we'll ask another one, <laughs> or, and, and, and a lawyer. G given that, all right, how much can um, we expect to get a handle, do you think, on what the implications are going to be if one were trying to change, c completely change, uh, a system that was put in uh, 40 years ago? for a different economy, for a different set of housing, for a different, whole different place, all right? How, how, how much can we realistically expect, do you think? I mean, I, I'm going to go back to your lead-in, which was you, you're humbled. Right. We're, hum, we're humbled, <laughs> frankly, with the task that we have here. So I'm going to ask you for, for your th help in what do you think is realistic um, for us to um, so, to know how much damage okay, <laughs> we could do if we break this. I go back to Colin Powell's, you break it, you own it. Okay? Yeah, I, I think you, you have a very daunting task. So uh, I, I'll say, I'll re this reminds me of something I learned in graduate school, which is an old tax is a good tax. Yeah. Because people, be, exactly because people have, have adapted to that tax. And as I had a discussion with another economist recently, and what he said to me was, you know, it works, right? I mean, the New York economy, I mean, I, I'm sure people would dispute it. It works for some people. At least the New York economy is strong. The New York City economy is strong right now. So I think you do want to be very careful about messing with things. Um, at the same time, you know, th there's sort of there's some, there's sort of some basic principles that 
um, that you want to think about. And um, I, I think uh, one thing is that anything you put in the system now is going to probably be in the system for a long time. And any complexity you put in the system is probably going to have complexity and effects in a long time. So I think you want to be very careful to the extent that you can to simplify, not to make it more complex. And I think you do want to be very humble in saying, yeah, I can draw it on a blackboard and say this is a more efficient or even a fairer system. But yeah, it, there's a, it's such a complicated system, I can't understand all the implications. So I, I think I want to go very slowly towards that. I, I don't know if that's helpful to you. That would, if I were sitting in your seat, that would be where I would come down. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, maybe the um, thing to study is the, is the 1986 Act, the Federal um, Tax Act, and the effect that it had on real estate. Um, it took away a lot of the. I mean, it, it um, included the took away passive activity losses yeah, at risk. I don't know if it's so much. Yeah, it's 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 the act that was passed when he was when he was president. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> exactly. Um, but it's not just the rates, it's also the, there are specific provisions that related to real estate. Oh, yeah. And I think the saving and loan, exactly, the passive loss stuff and the at-risk rules came in at that point. And I, and I think that had an effect on the on real estate values, the savings and loans crisis, I think, sort of, my understanding is it, it sort of came from some of that. So that might be one thing to look at. Unanticipated? It, I think it was unanticipated. I think some of it was unanticipated. I don't know if it was intended to, and we want to take away the obviously the tax breaks, but I don't know that the I, I doubt that the intent was to collapse the real estate market, right? <laughs> so I think that some of that was was unantic unanticipated, and then also the other thing. I mean, we're still watching the effects of the 2017 Act. And one thing that I've spent quite a bit of time looking at is these, is the 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 rule that provides a preferential treatment for people who are investing in opportunity zones, these qualified opportunity zones, and see, it, we, we're seeing like a lot of effort and activity trying to move money into those into those zones, so um, we can watch what happens with that, and there are other provisions we're still trying to wrap our heads around and, um, you know, figure out. So, yeah. so, yeah. so can I follow up on that a little bit, um, Professor Borden? In terms of um, your clients or um, people that, that you see that you're giving advice to, how are they thinking about commercial versus residential rental in a place like New York, given the difference in in taxation? Um, are, does that come yeah. into play in terms of whether <coughs> they are investing in offices, et cetera, or they're off, or they're investing in rentals? And how how is it coming into play? Yeah, I don't know that I've seen that effect. Um, again, it would go to the it would go to the return. It would be one cost. And there would be a lot of factors that go into that um, to the effect, it, yeah. So I, I don't know that I've seen anyone specifically say I'm going into commercial because the, the property tax is lower. I'm going into residential because, um, or I'm not going into residential because it's higher. Uh, and so, yeah, and I don't, I don't know. We'd have to look at, I, I just haven't, I haven't seen that. And the, and the values may be different and it may already be baked in and it may already affect the returns, right? So if we start to tinker with that, then you may start to see um, movements one way or the other. Along similar lines, when you're, when you're advising clients on projects like that, um, do you see a difference in terms of what the property taxes are in a transaction versus taxes in general? And does that make any difference? Well, th it, it would be a difference, and and they're doing they're doing a financial analysis, right? And so the property tax is going to be like an annual expense. Um, the other types of tax are the are the gain or loss that you're recognizing on the disposition of property, or the depreciation deduction that's going to be taken. Depreciation would be, uh, um, you know, a cost that's that that's recovered over over time. So, I guess that the um, the, 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 the tax on the transaction is, is a lot of times what we see people focusing on. When they're coming to us, they're talking about structuring a deal to get in or out of property in the most tax efficient manner. And that's mostly what, what, what I'm doing. And the property tax is something that sort of trails 
and would affect the um, return on investment over, over time. So uh, let me welcome uh, Commissioner uh, Elizabeth Velez, who uh, very graciously is, has rushed in from the airport. So thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. No, no. <laughs> uh, well, we won't. We we have enough of a daunting task to solve New York City's property taxes, not the shutdown. So uh, we're not going to take that on. Um, so um, other questions from the commissioners, but um, but help us think about uh, this question of you know renters versus the owners. Um, uh, I know Professor Merriman, you you've talked about that you know, where the incidents would fall. But one of the things that um, that we're hearing a lot about, not just in New York, but around the country, is a renter's tax credit that, some, you know, that is, is a direct credit on a renter's income tax that would attempt essentially to, to um, get back some of a proper, any property tax decrease onto that renter. And so I wonder if either of you have any thoughts or experience on that, and also w whether it might then just uh, essentially um, increase rents again, right? If, if landlords think that renters have more money in their pockets because they got a credit on their income taxes, does that just result in higher rents? So have we accomplished anything? Yeah. I, I think that's, th that's the right way to think about it are, are that, you know, if it's a market determined rent, right, then uh, you're, you're going to have that potential that, um, that it's what matters to the renter is the net cost and um, it's going to be essentially captured, any cut in property tax would be captured by the, by the owner. Um, you know, in, in listening to the, the discussion about preferential rents uh, in, in rent-controlled buildings, it strikes me that um, there must be some market forces at work here, right? So that's a, that's a concern. Yeah. Yeah, right. right. It, depends, it depends on the elasticities. I mean, I think one thing we shouldn't undervalue uh, and, you know, this is uh, the salience issue, right? Because it, we heard earlier that renters don't even, they don't really think about the property tax. Now, if you, if you, put, it on the pro, uh, if you put it on the income tax, maybe they start thinking about it more. Maybe that creates some pressures in the market, I, you know? And I, I think we get into the area of kind of what we call behavioral economics here about whether, whether it would make an, uh, a difference. And I, I guess, I mean, uh, you know, I don't know whether it, I've been I've been racking my brain as I was thinking about this testimony. I, I'm a b big believer in empiricism, and the question is: Is it possible to get evidence of this in some way? Is it possible to do some kind of experiments or is something like that to to understand this a little bit better? And I I don't the answer is I don't know, but uh, it's something worth thinking about. I think. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I just thought, yeah, so, so the, the, the thought that comes to mind is what, what is the purpose of the credit? Is it to, I mean, a lot of the, again, a lot of the breaks that we give to tax rates we give to home ownership is to encourage home ownership, that we give to homeowners. Is the goal of, the, of a credit for renters is to that to encourage people to rent? Um, and I don't, I don't know that we should be, what, yeah, I don't know if we should be using the tax law to affect behavior that way, but um, I mean, I think traditionally we've valued home ownership. Um, traditionally, homeowners have valued home ownership, and, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sure, um, sure. uh, and, um, and people elected by homeowners have valued home ownership. But, but part of the question is, um, and part of the defense of a renter's tax credit is that it's, it's leveling the playing field, especially in a city like New York where 70 percent of the people are renters, but also promoting stability in neighborhoods so that you don't have displacement from neighborhoods when taxes go up, et cetera. So it's achieving some of the same purposes as the homeowner mortgage interest deduction and other advantages are, um, but for renters, right? But also some people are arguing that it is a way of having the 
renters see the benefit of so renters could see the benefit of lower taxes on rental buildings in at least two different ways, right? One is a more long-term effect. We could get more building. And if we got more building, the elasticities would be more favorable to renters. And so we would get lower rents in the long run, right? In the short run, the question is, are there ways for the renters to see that in the short run, right? And so a renter's tax credit is sometimes offered for that. Right, and the question for you all is, does that make sense? And it, it, it may be the same result that we get with uh, or the questions that arise with the tax benefits for home ownership. Right? Do they really get passed on to the homeowners? You, you, yeah, it's the people that represent the homeowners. I think you might have said it might be the people who represent the real estate professionals and the bankers and and those people who are actually benefiting. So, yeah, I think this is the question: who gets the Right. Who, who benefits if we do move in one direction or the other? I mean, I, I think that the professional opinion of, a, of economists is if you talk something like the mortgage interest deduction, um, does, that, uh, does that have an effect on the housing market over the long run? I mean, I think you get a pretty much unanimous, yeah, there's, there's more home ownership because of it, right? But that's over the very long term in a very big country, right? The, the question in a more compressed economy is less clear, or the answer is less clear, I think. Let me follow up on this um, discussion. I'm, uh, I'm sort of, I'm, I'm, on a pa I'm on a panel here with housing experts, so I sometimes worry about speaking on housing. But, um, you know, I have this notion that if you're ultimately going to help renters, you have to build. And, uh, and anything else is pretty inexact. Um, and one of the things we have in the city, which federal policy re reinforces, is at the moment we have a, uh, an advantage given to homeowner classes of properties over rental properties. And this probably matters particularly in... Uh, co-ops and condos versus large rental properties, at least that's my thought. Uh, the property tax both favors co-op and condos over large rental properties, and obviously there are a series of federal benefits that favor the homeowning classes over, over commercial. Um, does, a, does that, and, and also just at least from the stories, I get the notion that you know, to a large extent, the price of land in the city is determined by, you know, its use as a condominium in condominium construction. Mm -hmm. At least price of land where we have it largely zo zoned for intensive enough use. So, do does that differential a part of our problem? If we want to get more rental housing, do we need to be looking at compress compression of that differential? And I notice. Uh, my friend from the Co-op and Condo uh, Owners Association is here, so don't sweat it too much. But <laughs> it's just a question. <laughs> so, yeah, I'll, I'll address maybe the federal tax comment. You said there, we, we did, there are benefits, um, federal tax benefits that apply to homeowners. We have the home mortgage interest deduction and then also the, the exclusion on the sale of a, of a property. Can, a married couple can exclude up to 500000 um, A single individual can exclude up to 250000 on, com on the commercial side, we have Section 1031, which allows a, the owner of a of property held for investment or for business use to sell that property, reinvest the proceeds in other real estate, and there is no cap on that. So, um, yeah, we, we, there there are different types of benefits for um, I guess the different types of, of property. With the with the home ownership, we have the cap at five hundred thousand for the married couple, but um, you know hundreds of millions, billions of dollars um, are excluded. Through, through Section 1031. Well, what I usually try to teach my students, is a, which is a little bit complex, is that the mortgage interest deduction actually does not benefit homeowners relative to, to renters. The, the benefit to homeowners is that they aren't taxed on the value of the shelter because it's an implicit benefit rather than, whereas a renter has to pay in after-tax dollars. So I think with all due respect, there, there's at least compare renters versus owners. There's a significant tax benefit to being an owner. Um, 
there, there's a, uh, yeah, there's a, there's a benefit to the owner of the of the rental property. There are tax. Uh, no, there's the a benefit tax. to the owner to the owner occupied unit gets a benefit because they get the value of that shelter and they don't have to count it as an income, right? Right. And and uh, so. I don't know. I mean, there's no easy way to undo that, right? I mean, you could give some subsidy to rental to undo it. But I think it's a good point that uh, whereas home ownership is generally, you know, encouraged in lots of neighborhoods and lots of places in New York City, that's probably not something that I guess it's very arguable whether you'd want to encourage home ownership, right? That's not the norm. It's it, it, almost uniquely probably around the country. I'm going to try to strip it down to, to the bare essentials, right? So there, there are at least two strands of uh, the discussion that we're having. One is redistribution. The other is growth, I think, uh, on growth in the supply of space. Uh -huh. So what are the characteristics? And I now we shifted towards, you know, should we tax differently same space that's used for shelter but is owned differently? So what are the characteristics of a property tax system that are optimal for the growth of the city? Uh, well, I think, you know, again, going back to the, the Lincoln Institute is like, so, something that doesn't discourage structure, the buildings of structure, so something that's tilted more towards land and less towards structure. So where are the split uh, taxation? System. Some kind of split taxation is, you know, likely to be more economically efficient. So Very difficult to implement, hasn't been implemented in many places around the country, but... Uh, you know, that's uh, in terms of in terms of economic efficiency or growth, uh, and uh, that would be uh, the easiest policy recommendation to make. And so, you do it for everybody, or ju you do it just at the margin for new buildings? <sighs> well, the margin is what determines you know the 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 econo new economic activity, um, but. If you only do it at the margin, then there's some distortion of the in the in you know the incentives to maintain the existing buildings, and so you'd have to be concerned about that. But but that would mean more filtering. I'm sorry. That would mean more filtering. <sighs> I know I'm. Not <laughs> so we understand. Okay. Small club here. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Again, other other than uh, Minneapolis or Minnesota, are there places that you would have us particularly look to? And also, are there places that you would have us not look to? So, for example, what happened in Pittsburgh um, with uh, with more of the land value taxation? Yeah, the, the Pittsburgh uh, did have this kind of split rate uh, tax. Um, and uh, in Pennsylvania, it's, it's uh, I guess it's legally allowed, or at least it's more common. There are a number of smaller areas ha that have it. In Pittsburgh, as I understand it, they have, you know, Pittsburgh, first of all, did very well. If you look at a steel town that came back, and some people attribute it, I think, at least part of that to the split rate taxation. But they did uh, do away with it, is my understanding. So I'm not terribly familiar with that case. I'd really like to get back to you if you, you give me a, a week or two to, to kind of look at the literature and, and I'll, I'll email you. Can I, can I maybe just follow up really quickly? I mean, the thought about the commercial versus um, homeowner or property owned by a, by a homeowner, an occupier, someone who occupies it. Um, there, yeah, we have, we have, we, we mentioned the mortgage interest deduction. We mentioned the exclusion on the federal side. If you're looking at the property that's being leased, the owner of that has depreciation deduction and is also able to deduct the interest on any um, amounts borrowed to acquire the property, and also you get the, the gain exclusion on the sale. So that might be, I don't know how those cost savings on the, on the federal level get passed on to the, to the, to the renters, but that might be, it's, it's sort of the same type of question. Right? We are providing um, on the federal level, we're providing benefits for both parties that just come in, in different ways. And actually, maybe the benefit goes that, that goes to the commercial side may be greater than the benefit that's provided on the on the um, residential um, owner-occupied property. Well, part of that goes back to the salience question, right? Uh, right. The mortgage interest deduction is very salient. You 
you know, you take it off of your of your income tax, and so you know what it is. Whereas, there's no salience for renters. And I, I wonder, um, especially Professor Borden, in your commercial deals, right, in the commercial deals that you advise on, presumably the lessees of any commercial space are paying the property tax directly, right? And they're seeing the salience in their net leases or whatever, right? If you're doing a, a lease, I, I don't do a lot of lease work. It'd be the owner's, and it, from the owner's perspective, it's commercial for an owner mm -hmm. isn't necessarily going to distinguish between office space um, and you know, residential property. Well, uh, so, so if you're, yeah, yeah. So, so let me ask the question of, of of both of you. I mean, how important is salience? We've got a lot of issues on our plate. Um, we certainly hear you that simplicity, um, keep it simple, stupid is is um, you know the way that we should be thinking about this. Um, and so, how important is salience? Because renters do not think that they pay any of this, as evidenced by. Right. The fact that we're, they're not talking right. about it in the Rent Guidelines Board hearings, and yet they are 70% of the city's residents. So how important is that salience factor? So knowing whether that's important in this, how important that is in this specific instance, I, I don't have any empirical evidence to tell you about. I think one thing we've learned over the last 10 years from there's been a whole, for those of you who aren't economists, there's been a whole revolution in behavioral economics. And we found that salience matters a lot. My own belief is salience matters a lot more in the short run than it does in the long run because you don't have market forces. But, um, you know, particularly there, I guess there's, uh, I think I think in my and this is really my intuition, is that salience is going to make the adjustment happen faster that would have happened in the long run. So if you do something to make it visible to renters to the extent that that's going to, you know, drive down rents, um, it's much more likely to happen more quickly, right? Uh, and where... Uh, I think it, you know you're likely to get some adjustments over time. In any case, but uh, it's likely to happen more quickly. Yeah, it's something that I haven't um, really studied and given a lot of thought to. I mean, it's yeah, the market to some extent determines what the rent is going to be, right? And, it, and and I guess that the property owners are going to charge the highest amount possible, right? Right. And the and so <laughs> if if they can continue to charge what they're charging, then they they benefit from the. Um, lower property tax. If it's if, if it's commercial, it's it's negotiate. It would be negotiated in the lease, right? Um, and there may be a little bit. What's that? Invisible. Exactly. Yeah. And it, and there may be. There's different bargaining strength too when you're talking about commercial than when you're talking about re, uh, residential leases. Uh, Professor Mary, I mean, you've written also about this issue about caps or limits on 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 uh, the growth in assessments, and so I wonder, which also is a, of course a major concern, and as you recognized, um, a, a puzzle about New York City's system. So, could you uh, advise us as to what you think the ideal uh, system is for dealing with? large increases that may make people, you know, house rich but cash poor and and therefore struggling to keep up with their property tax payments even though their the value of their house on paper is is increasing. Um yeah. <laughs> I, 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 let me let me just uh, wind back a little bit and tell you we we had an experience in Chicago where we had, you know, a, a property boom, and so that uh, prices went up very, very rapidly, and assessments therefore went up very rapidly. And as a reaction to that, there were assessment limits put in. And the result, and with a, with a, some other people, I did an analysis of this, and I think most people thought of this as protecting kind of low-income homeowners who would be hit a lot by high 
uh, property taxes. And when we looked at it, when we looked at the data and we looked extensive, we did all every cross tab you could possibly do, like literally 300 pages of cross tabs looking at different places because that's what the legislature wanted us to do. What we found is that there was hardly any evidence that it did anything to protect low-income communities. And the biggest benefits, by and large, went to you know, relatively wealthy communities where there were rapid assessment increases. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, and yet the, the discussion in the legislature, it was, it was really bizarre to me because it was like we were saying, look, this, this is what the effect is. We've got all these cross tabs we can show you. And then we got attacked by people who said, you know, you want to push all elderly people out of their homes, right? And so, so my, my reaction is, um, you know, if the, if the goal is to, uh, and I think it's a very legitimate goal to protect, you know, vulnerable households. So we're talking about relatively low-income households. We're talking about elderly households that don't have much income. Then, you know, the the strategy you want to pursue to the greatest extent possible is to delay the payment of the of the property taxes. And then when the property is sold, you capture the property taxes, right? Or if that's too hard, people get very nervous about the fact that they're building up this debt. Okay, you forgive it, but you, the amount that you forgive, ba you know, is got is based on income. And again, that that makes it more complex. But uh, I'm convinced, at least from the experience that I saw, and this was in Cook County, um, that these things uh, have very unintended consequences, and uh, they make the system very complex. When the property market then started to fall, uh, these assessment limits, what they did is they kept certain households taxes up in, in the down property market. And that seemed completely unfair to people too. So uh, my ideal system is one that's narrowly targeted to the households that you're most concerned about. All right. And again, if you have any particular jurisdictions that you'd like us to look at, we'd appreciate that. So, uh, okay. Again, okay. let me get you back to you on that. Yeah. Okay. Ray, uh, and then we'll finish up. Another direction, though, on caps, um, the uh, we've had testimony and, and approaches from the co-op community in Queens who aren't covered by ca assessment caps, but would like to be, in part because now some of that's about the peculiarities of our way we tax co-ops they found the changes in market values well my own co-op which is in Brooklyn one year saw a hundred and twenty percent increase in our market value which had no relationship to anything observable in the real world um, and they saw some rather radical changes in there and they were looking for something that allowed them to do predictability and planning so that was how they were approaching, and, and, and with all, all due respect to my colleagues in the Department of Finance who are here, um, but uh, they're look, they've been looking for something that does predictability and planning, and they saw caps as one thing that made things much more predictable for their co-ops. Any thought on that or other ways of getting greater predictability I into, these, into the system? Yeah, uh, I think uh, the, uh, first of all, you're not going to have a good property tax system unless you get high quality assessments. So that's that's fundamental, and I, it, we haven't had a chance to talk about that. But that, that really is fundamental. One of the things, so in Cook County, where, where I come from, we we have a tripartite system. We we only uh, assess a third of the properties each year on a rolling basis. You have a million properties in New York. You assess all of them every year. And I, one thing I would say is, at least think about the trade offs of uh, more rolling in assessments, would that improve the quality of the assessments, right? And I don't know if it would. Um, the predictability is, I think, important uh, for because households have to budget and businesses have to budget for property taxes. But it's also there's a lot of perceived unfairness when you get uh, rather dramatic changes. So. Yeah, that's that's an issue. Um, 
I, I think what's more important than the predictability of the build taxes is the predictability of the, ta of the amount you actually have to come up with. So it would be possible, again, I don't want to make it too complex, but to have a system where the payments were uh, more gradual. I mean, one of the things we, some of us in the property tax community have talked about is, uh, at least in uh, where I come from, the property taxes are billed twice a year. There's no reason why you couldn't pay it monthly, right? That would make it a little easier to roll things in. So, so that kind of thing could happen. Okay. Um, so our, our time is up, um, but we, I think I speak on behalf of all of the commission members in, in saying that we very much appreciate the three of you um, devoting your time to thinking about this problem and, um, and sharing your thoughts with us. Um, it's been very, very helpful. And... We very much appreciate it. So thank you. Um, and um, we will also look forward to your comments once we have uh, a set of proposals. So, um, so thank you very, very much. Thanks. Thank you. Is Sabil on? Is my colleague Sabil on your? I'm sorry. Is my colleague Sabil on your? Um, hey, he was. He's great. He's great. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, he was he's, uh, for two years, I think. Okay. And then he's kept in and started working on the project. Yeah, he's, doing, he's, not, he's not that, uh, he has an office at the school, but he's not there right now. He's on leave. Oh, great. He's, okay. he's directing some organizations. Yeah, there was some project that he was getting involved with. Um, yeah.